Good morning, everybody. The plenary session will begin in a few minutes. Please take your seats.
Good morning, one more time. The plen plenary session will begin uh, already. Please take your seats. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Venkat Selva Manikam. I'm going to summarize his great work. He's an MD Anderson Chair Professor of Mechanical Engineering and the founding director of the Advanced Manufacturing Institute at the University of Houston. Previously, he was the Chief Technology Officer of Superpower Incorporated, a former subsidiary of Philips Electronics. He led Superpower to multiple world records, the longest thin film superconductor made and first the pilot manufacturing. He led the world's first significant delivery of thin film superconductor tapes to build a power transmission cable in Albany, New York, which is the world's first superconductor device in the power grid. At the University of Houston, Professor Selva Manikam led a highly successful Department of Energy funded program to quadruple the performance as and superconductor tapes and is now leading another Department of Energy funded program on advanced manufacturing of these tapes. These high performance tapes have been scaled up to 50 meter lengths in his facility. Professor Sevamanikam is also the founder and CEO of MPIRS LLC that develops new superconductor tape white te architectures to meet application requirements, it scales up University of Houston technologies to manufacturing and provides technical advisory services to superconductor companies. Today, Professor Servamanikam will present the interesting talk titled Advanced High Temperature Superconductors for High Magnetic Fields Applications. Please welcome Professor Selva Manikam. Okay, good morning everybody. I'm glad to see you all. Um, I was in this uh, conference about uh, 10 years ago and happy to be back here in Cancun. And I'd like to first uh, thank all the organizers, especially Professor Martin Herrera, to invite me to, for inviting me to this uh, wonderful conference. Um, so as uh, Dr. Herrera mentioned, my presentation is on um, advanced supernatural technology uh, that I've been working for uh, quite some time. Uh, first, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge all the uh, collaborators and contributors to this work, uh, a lot of my students and staff at the University of Houston, at Ampere's, as well as our funding agency, especially at the Department of Energy. So uh, this uh, uh, provides outline of a presentation. Uh, so I'm going to introduce um, RIPCO, we call it RIPCO, which is stands for Rare Earth Barium Copper Oxide Superinting, Thin Film Superinting Tapes. Uh, then I'll talk about how we actually make these tapes, uh, process of roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing. So what is unique about these superinting tapes is that these are epitaxial films but on a flexible polycrystalline substrates. Um, and then um, I'll discuss nanoengineering defects into these epitaxial films so as to achieve high performance in high magnetic fields. Um, and then a new process that we developed at the university called advanced MOCVD or advanced metal organic chemical vapor deposition uh, for, especially for high field applications. Um, then, uh, as uh, Professor Herrera mentioned, uh, one, one thing that we do at the university is also not just do research on a lab scale basis, but also work on advanced manufacturing to scale up our technology to long lens. So I'll talk about some of the results there. And then our, our latest work on double serrated tapes. Um, double serrated tapes basically mean coating thin films on both sides so as to get high performance. And then finally, I'll conclude with uh, some opportunities that are available uh, for uh, R&D in this field. And there's, this field is actually starting to really grow commercially, and uh, there's so much demand for this technology and for, uh, for researchers and scientists and engineers in this field. So I'll highly encourage you all to certainly look into this area of the supernatures. 
All right, so just to um, introduce this uh, uh, Repco uh, thin film superintendent tapes. So what you see on the photograph, the tape is from the outside, looks like a piece of copper, copper tape. But that copper tape that you see on, in that, uh, uh, in, in that uh, picture can carry the same amount of current as these two copper cables that you see there. So in general, these superintendent tapes can carry 300 to 600 times more current than a comparably sized copper wire. So you can see really the huge benefit of transporting large amounts of power through these superintending tapes. So since you can do that, there are many, many applications possible. And I have listed uh, several of these applications in here. They can be used for energy applications, uh, for medical applications, industrial applications, research, transportation, and the defense. Um, so the value proposition for these superintendents are many. You, know, you can actually have enhanced energy efficiency, especially as we now transition to clean energy, how do you transport electricity over long distances without resistance? Um, how do you make uh, electric aviation feasible? How do you make uh, uh, compact fusion, which I'm going to talk about, uh, which is essentially uh, producing electricity from hydrogen? Um, and uh, so many, many opportunities are, are, are available using these superintendents. And uh, so, uh, uh, so basically, the first application is that of power cables. This is one of the earliest applications, as uh, Dr. Herrera mentioned. We actually demonstrated in the power grid 15 years ago. Um, and uh, so the advantage of superintending cables is that they can carry 5 to 10 times more power uh, than conventional copper cables. So you can actually use them in underground ducts. Let's see this video here. So basically, uh, you know, kind of showing schematic, you can replace five of these copper cables with a single superintendent cable. And so especially in very densely populated areas like New York City or so on, where there's no place to actually put in a new trench to pull a new cable, you can actually retrofit existing conduits with the superintendent cable and get more power. And also, if you look at long distance power transmission, especially if you look at solar energy and wind energy farms, they are usually located in very remote areas. Uh, one of the challenges is how do you uh, move power from these remote areas from the solar farms and wind farms to urban areas. And you need to construct new power transmission lines. And these power transmission lines are operating at much high voltage, very high voltage. And that requires a lot of uh, several years, 15 years generally, to get permission to get the, uh, get the right of way. On the other hand, superintending power lines, superintending cables can operate underground and they are operating at much, much lower voltage because essentially they can carry high amounts of current. So you can uh, put the superintending power lines next to natural gas pipelines. You can put them next to train, uh, rail, railway tracks. So the right of way is much less. So the uh, superintending power transmission is really a lot of, uh, brings a lot of value for long distance power transmission. Another uh, example I'd like to show you is um, the superintending uh, degaussing cables for the US Navy. This is actually already used by the US Navy today. So what this is, is this is a degaussing cable. So all the Navy warships, they have these cables around the ship uh, so that to kill the magnetic signature of the ship. You can see there, uh, when the, without the, you know, without the uh, cable on, you can actually see the magnetic signature ship, and once the cable is turned on, that, sh that signature really goes away. So that prevents the mines, the underground mines, from exploding when they see the magnetic signature of the ships. So what the ships do today is they have this large copper cables wound around the ship uh, so as to act as a degaussing cable. Uh, they, are, they consume a lot of power, and they are also very heavy. So 14, in fact, more like 20 of these uh, copper cables can be replaced by one superintendent cable. So it's already been installed. You can see the USS Higgins already using this uh, degaussing cables. And in fact, there are five more ships that are being retrofitted with these degaussing cables. So this is already a, a practical application of the superintending cables. So there are uh, obviously you know, several applications. Um, you know, I just talked a couple of them here. Um, and uh, so especially as you look forward, you know, um, Mexico, US, elsewhere, you're looking at clean energy transition over the next 20 years, uh, superintendents, high temperature superintendents especially, can be an enabler in this clean energy transition. So I'll just give a few examples here. Electric aviation, right? There's a lot of uh, work going on in converting jet fuel power planes to electric planes, electric uh, 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 aviation. And power generation, I'm going to talk briefly about compact fusion. 
where there are many, many companies uh, in the last five years that have started to create fusion energy um, uh, from, uh, uh, from fusing hydrogen. And uh, so um, and that's one example where supernatives are already making an impact. Uh, industrial motors, uh, you can replace copper-based motors with superintending motors, and I already talked about power transmission cables. And on the right side, I listed the CO2 emissions that can be saved, can be avoided by using uh, the superintending technology. So many, many uh, areas of electric power transmission, electric power generation, electric power use, uh, you can actually cut down on the CO2 emission just by retrofitting or replacing it with the superintending uh, technology. So with that uh, as a background, so let's talk about the actual material itself. So these are thin film superintending tapes. And like I said, it's kind of unique technology in that these are epitaxial films on a thin, uh, on a flexible substrate. And they are, you know, the, the tape is made by roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing. So this actually shows a cartoon, a schematic of the superintending tape. And you can see that uh, it consists of many layers. So we start off with a nickel alloy the, called Hasloy. And the has loy provides the substrate for over which you're growing several films. And then you have buffer layer. I'll talk about the buffer layer in, in, a, in, a, in a couple of minutes. And then you have a superintending film. You can see the superintending film is very thin. It's only about one to two microns thick because the superintending can carry so much current, you don't need much of it. You need only a thin film of that. And then most of it, as you can see, is copper and nickel alloy. And you can see the cross-sectional uh, of the microstructure, uh, cross-sectional uh, image. Of the, of the tape, you can see 97% is inexpensive nickel and copper alloy. Only 1% or 2% is a superconducting film. And this is made by continuous process of roll-to-roll -roll manufacturing, so it is really less labor-intensive than many other technologies. However, uh, uh, there was a fundamental challenge with making these uh, thin film superconducting tapes. Because if you're actually depositing the thin superconducting as a thin film, on a single crystal substrate, basically an epitaxial film, you can get a high current carrying capacity or a critical current density, which is five million amperes per square centimeter. Just as a comparison, copper can only handle 100 to 1,000 amperes per square centimeter. So you can see the superintending film itself can carry five million amperes per square centimeter. But that's only if you grow the superintending film on a single crystal substrate. If you grow the same superintending film on a polycrystalline substrate, you can only carry about 10,000 amp per square centimeter, about 500 times less current than growing on a, sing, on a, on a, on a single crystal substrate. So the problem is that uh, the reason for this is the grain-to-grain -grain misorientation. If you grow it on a polycrystalline substrate, obviously you have grain boundaries, and those grain boundaries are an impediment to the flow of current. So this actually was recognized in some work that was done 25 years ago or 30 years ago, where researchers took bicrystals, basically two single crystal substrates attached together, and they deposited the superintending film on top of that. So now if you measure the current across just one boundary, right, because you have two crystals with one boundary, just across one boundary, you can see the current density across that boundary in the graph. And you can see it's a log scale. So when the current, uh, the grain boundary misorientation angle exceeds 10 degrees, or even five degrees, the current density across one boundary drops by orders of magnitude. So obviously in a single crystal film, you can get really good performance, but in a typical polycrystal film, you can see the current carrying capacity is uh, very low. And that was a challenge. So he cannot, obviously, he, he tried to make the superintending uh, tapes as a coating over, you know, on a polycrystal substrate, he cannot really carry much current. So what's the alternative now? So you cannot really make a thin crystal over one kilometer long, right? Because you need this in lengths of hundreds of meters, so one kilometer to make into a cable or in make into a wire. Um, so you cannot do that on a single crystal substrate. So you need to have a technology where you can deposit these films, a single crystal-like film or an epitaxial film on a polycrystalline, low-cost, flexible substrate. So that was a challenge. So the solution that was developed uh, several years ago is a technology called ion beam acid deposition or IBAD. So this is a really a very, very versatile process. You can, uh, what you can do is you can use any substrate. You can use a nickel alloy like we do. We can use stainless steel. We can use glass. You can even use polymers for that matter. So what you do is you are depositing the film uh, on a roll-to-roll on a, on a, on a -to -roll process, and you're depositing the film like magnesium oxide. And while you're depositing this, you're also bombarding the film with the low energy argon ions. So, uh, so while you're bombarding the film with low energy argon ions, along a certain direction. 
this is the ion channeling direction. Typically, um, in this case, for a cubic material like magnesium oxide, is a 101 direction. So if you do along the 45 degree angle, what you get is the biashi texture. You can see in the cartoon there, the grains are aligned with respect to each other within a few degrees. And you actually can see that in the X-ray pole figure on the right-hand side, that uh, in the alignment of the ion beams around 45 degrees, you can get a very sharp texture where the grains are aligned within, say, five degrees or so. If you change the alignment of the uh, ion bombardment to, say, 60 degrees, now you can see the texture is not as good. So uh, by this, you can actually uh, create a nice template where the grains are aligned with respect to each other within five degrees. And this is a very fast process because you need only 10 nanometers of this film. So once you have created this IBAD film, now we can actually epitaxially grow many, many types of films on this. So by the way, you can actually monitor the quality of this magnesium oxide IBAD film by read reflection high energy electron diffraction in situ while you're actually doing the process. So you can confirm the quality of the film that you're making. And like I said, once you, can, once you make the IBAD film, then you can grow many films. We have grown oxides, nitrides, silicides, arsenides, metals, we can grown all uh, semiconductors, we grown all kinds of films epitaxially using this uh, technology. So here we're using mostly oxides. And if you look at, in this case, superting film grown on this kind of substrate, you can see the X-ray pole figure it looks like a single crystal material. It's not, it's actually a polycrystal material, but now the grain to grain misorientation of the superant is only two degrees. So like I showed you in the previous chart, if you have grain to grain misorientation within two degrees, you can, you know, then the current carrying capacity is not affected. So uh, however, you know, that is the technology development, but then how do you scale up to manufacturing? There are many, many challenges in scaling up to manufacturing. You had to grow this epitaxial film over a kilometer. It's never been done in any system, to my knowledge. Um, and then you had to achieve uniform current over long lengths, which means you need to have control the stoichiometry composition of the film has to control over kilometer lengths. You need to maintain the thickness of all the different buffer layers, which is typically nanometers thickness over kilometers. Um, also, you need to do it fast, right? Because you, know, you need to make hundreds of hundreds of meters. And so you need to have high, vapor, high rate vapor depression methods. Um, and then you've got to do it over large areas, typically over area of, area of about, uh, you know, almost a square meter. Um, and you had to maintain the process in a stable manner over, say, 30, 40 hours. So many challenges, very unique to this technology, uh, had to be um, uh, overcome. And so lots of material science development, a lot of engineering, a lot of uh, equipment uh, sci uh, designs were developed to scale up this technology to, uh, to kilometer. Uh, it was successfully done. So uh, as uh, Professor Hera mentioned, I was previously the company superpower, and we are the first ones to actually make this in less of a kilometer. So that is actually in the buffer tape, the buffer film uh, over um, you know, a kilometer, 1.4 kilometers. And you can see the grain-to-grain -grain misorientation measured by X-ray diffraction continuously over a kilometer. I said it was about six degrees, which is pretty good. And then when you grow this epitaxial film, by, in this case by metal organic chemical vapor deposition or MOCVD, you can see a kilometer long tape uh, with the good current carrying capacity. So uh, this technology uh, was developed again 15 years ago. And not only that, we actually installed this technology in the power grid. Uh, so that actually shows a, a cutout of a power transmission cable. It's a three phase uh, power transmission cable, 36 kilovolt cable. And the, uh, what you see in the kind of copper color, that's actually the superning tapes. It's a very, very thin material. Uh, most of it is copper and other insulation and everything. Um, and in, you can see the photograph it was installed in, back in 2007. And, and, and on the left side, you see, on the bottom left side, you see uh, interstate freeway I-90 going from Boston to Buffalo. It's installed under the freeway. And that actually delivered power to about 25,000 households. So this technology is starting from basic material science of how do you control grain orientation. You, we brought it from that to all the way to the power grid you know, in a matter of about 10 years. All right, so back in 2006, there's only two companies making these tapes. Now there are at least seven companies and uh, more coming up. And right now there's so much demand for the supernators. The demand is far exceeding supply. Uh, like I said, this is a good career move also if you are interested in a career in supernators because so much demand for engineers and scientists working this field. All right, so how do you, uh, what's the next step? So um, uh, initial in applications are power cables, but then there are other applications which you know are very high magnetic fields. And what happened was, so these supernators can carry good current in a zero magnetic field without a magnetic field. But as soon as you apply a magnetic field, even a Tesla or so, you can see what's happening on the chart the current carrying capacity degrades very rapidly. 
So we really cannot use it in a, any kind of a magnetic field application. And also, you can see this material is quite anisotropic. So what happens is if you apply a magnetic field along the tape direction, parallel to the tape direction, you can carry uh, good current. But once you move the uh, magnetic field away from the tape direction, um, and most cases, a lot of magnetic field a lot of the applications, the field is perpendicular to the tape direction, the current carrying capacity drops off quite rapidly. And this is because the material is anisotropic. This is an orthorhombic material, it's very anisotropic, it got good conduction in the basal plane, but very poor conduction in the perpendicular direction. However, the, the, good, the good news is that the current density is not ex intrinsic property, it's an extrinsic property, and that can be manipulated by adding nanoscale defects. So, uh, in the case of super is somewhat different from semiconductors. Semiconductors, you want to avoid defects, where superconductors, you actually like to incorporate defects. The reason is that when you apply a magnetic field, the magnetic flux lines or vortices, they penetrate into the superconductor, and if they, uh, once they penetrate into the superconductor, when you have flow current, the Lorentz force will actually make the uh, vortices move around, and that will dissipate energy, and the material will not be able to carry much current. However, if you introduce defects, these vortices, will be energetically favorable for the vortices to penetrate the defects rather than the superconductor. So they get pinned and held by these defects. And if you can do that, then you can actually go to much higher currents before the vortices break loose and they move around and dissipate energy. So the thing is that the, to, for ideally, you want to have the defects at the same scale, same scale as the vortices, uh, vortices. These vortices are typically about few nanometers in size which means the defects also, you preferably be in the range of few nanometers. So, but how do you now implement that in an epitaxial film, right? So that is a challenge, and there, many researchers worked on this, and I'll show the results from our group. So this, I'm going to see a cross-section of a superning film, which is one micron thick, made by MOCVD, and it's an epitaxial film. Like I said, you see the buffer layers in there, and the flexible substrate is on below that. So while we are growing this epitaxial film, what we do is we add some zirconium to the film, to the precursor, and when you do that, you form this barium zirconate nanoscale or nano rods, nano columns. And you can see that in the high resolution microscopy on the cross section. And in the plan view, you can see the circles. Those are actually the you know, size of these nano rods. So the beauty is that these nano rods are growing on top of its, themselves. The reason is this barium zirconate has a large lattice mismatch with the superconductor, about 8%, 9% lattice mismatch. So the barium zirconate does not want to grow on the superconducting film. So the barium zirconate wants to self-assemble on top of itself. And uh, so the barium zirconate is growing by itself, and the superconducting film is epitaxially growing. So you can do epitaxial film growth and the self-assembly growth simultaneously in the same film, this, in the same process. So that's what is done. And when you do that, you can see the difference in the performance. So the blue is what I showed you before. When you apply a magnetic field, the current carrying capacity drops off when you align the magnetic field away from the parallel direction. And the red is when you apply the, when, with the, the film with the nano rods, and you can see a significant boost in the performance, especially when the magnetic field is aligned perpendicular or parallel to the nano rods. And uh, so this was technology was developed about 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago, and it was actually translated to the industry. And a lot of the research that we do is actually, uh, we, we, we always make sure that we get transferred to, you know, to manufacturing, and it's been used as a standard product for, for quite some time. Uh, so now with this uh, material, now we can not only operate at uh, you know, a higher temperature, but also in high magnetic fields. So now new applications at ultra high magnetic fields became possible. So what I'm showing the chart is uh, two low temperature superconductors, nine titanium, nine three ten. They can go up to magnetic fields up to ten tesla or fifteen tesla. But beyond that, you cannot really go to high fields because they drop off the you know the you know the performance drops off at uh, magnetic fields above fifteen tesla. Whereas the Repco, you can see this is actually a previous generation of Repco. You can actually go to magnetic fields beyond 20 Tesla. So now, uh, engineers started looking at many applications where it was not possible so far to do with superconductors. And one application that's really caught on fire right now is compact fusion. And you probably heard a lot of the news in the last uh, few years. The many, many companies have started now working on compact fusion. So these are all tokamaks. Basically, these are magnets, very powerful magnets operating at 20 Tesla. And the reason you use magnets in compact fusion is that you can't find the plasma, right? Because in a, in a, in a, in a fusion device, you're fusing hydrogen uh, atoms uh, to, uh, and uh, in the, your temperature's like a million degrees, several million degrees, and you had to confine the plasma because you need to contain it, you don't hit the walls of the container. And uh, so 
there's already a big fusion um, uh, reactor that's being built in France called ITER, International Thermonuclear Energy Experimental Reactor. And uh, so, but that is just an experimental reactor. It's not a power plant. And it's also huge. Whereas what is being, uh, that's made with the low temperature superconductors. Whereas the new uh, compact fusion uh, design is based on this high temperature Repco superconducting tapes. So we can go to much higher fields than the low temperature superconductors. And the power that can be produced by a compact fusion reactor goes as a fourth power as a magnetic field. So if you increase the magnetic field from 15 tesla to 20 tesla, you can substantially increase the power. Or the same power can be produced in a much, much more compact volume. And that's why compact fusion is now getting a lot of traction, a lot of investment going on in this ALDA right now. And as early as two years from now, a company uh, is a spin out of MIT, is going to be uh, planning to demonstrate a compact fusion device with energy gain of 10 times, which means 10 times more power than, he, than what he put in. And if they're successful, this field is going to just blow up like crazy. Uh, but even for these um, devices, you need lots and lots of, lots of the superintending tapes, about 20,000 kilometers for one device. So that's one example. And also another commercial example of the superintendence is uh, for NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And uh, so far, all the NMR systems have been limited to one gigahertz. Uh, because, the super, the, because again, the NMR systems are operating at 20, 21, 20, uh, 21, 22 Tesla. But you want to go beyond that, you cannot do this conventional superintending magnets. Whereas with this Repco superintending magnets, this you can see on the left-hand side, uh, Bruker has made a 1.2 gigahertz and planning to go to even higher frequencies. So especially this will be useful for drug, uh, you know, drug discovery, pharmaceutical companies, where you actually can get much better resolution when you go to higher frequency. So uh, that's possible because of this Repco superintending magnet. Actually, that one actually uses a Repco superintending magnet. Another example is user facility. Uh, National High Magnetic Field Lab in Tallahassee, Florida, has have built a 32 Tesla magnet that can operate uh, for a user facility and, of course, for science and discovery. You know, it's extremely useful. So those are some applications. There are many, many applications. Particle accelerators, uh, magnetic energy storage, uh, MRIs. You know, the many applications are feasible uh, by using superconductors in very high magnetic fields. And uh, so, uh, so that is the opportunity. So now, how do you capitalize on it? How do you actually um, make sure this technology really gets into all these different areas? So that's where we come into our, our research that's going on at the University of Houston, which is called Advanced MOCVD, and explain why we're doing this. Okay, so this chart has come out busy, but I'll explain to you why, you know, why we are actually working in this field. So in spite of all advantages, you know, the, uh, the superintendent still have not really been used widely right now because of the cost. The cost is still pretty, pretty high. Uh, what I'm showing you uh, there in the first row is the cost of the conductor. The cost is typically given in terms of dollars per kilowatt meter. It's similar to solar cells where they give dollars per watt or LEDs, dollars per lumen. Here is dollars per kilowatt meter because uh, you have performance also included in the cost. So today's cost of a superconductor is about $200 per kilowatt meter. What that means is that for a superconductor that can carry one kiloamp or 1,000 amperes, it'll cost about $200. In generally, basically, the cost actually is $30 a meter. That superconductor can carry 150 amperes. The problem with that is that, you know, for a fusion device, you need three to four gigaamp meter. You need lots and lots of these tapes. The tape itself will cost about $600 million. That is actually the cost of a full-scale natural gas 400 megawatt power plant, right? So if they cannot have the, you cannot have compact fusion to be commercial, the tape itself is costing as much as the natural gas power plant. Second thing is 20,000 kilometers is required for one fusion device, whereas it's quite expensive to make this tape, right? Uh, if you make even 1,000 kilometers, it costs $50 million to set up a manufacturing plant. So we have a project going on right now to reduce the cost by a factor of 200 to uh, 20 to $10 per kilowatt meter mainly by increasing the performance. Instead of 150 amperes, go 10 times more to 1,500 amperes. So at that cost, you can actually can make the device, the, the, the superintendent will be 30 to $40 million, which will be a lot, less accept, a lot more acceptable. And also, with a lot more tape, you don't need much tape, right? You need 10 times less tape. That will also reduce the burden on the production capacity. So that's the goal. And uh, so, uh, so this kind of, kind of says that same thing again, is that right now, all this compact fusion, all the other magnets, they use stack of these tapes because they're operating at 50,000 amperes on so, uh, very high currents. So they have to stack 200 or 400 of these tapes to get this high current. And instead of that, if you can have more current, 
you need only 20 tapes or 40 tapes, right? So you don't need as much. So that is the plan. So how do you do that? So coming back to the slide again, now the goal is to increase the current carrying capacity even more. So the two ways of doing it is to make the films thicker. Remember I told you at the beginning, the films the, are only one to two microns thick. Can you make them four microns thick? Can you make them five microns thick, right? It's not that thick, right? So can you do that? So that seems to be simple, but it's not, unfortunately. The second thing is introduce pinning centers. I already mentioned about pinning centers. Can you make them more effective? Right? So here's where the material science comes in. How do you make that uh, the current carrying capacity 10, 10, 10 times more? All right, so unfortunately, it doesn't really easily work that you just make the films thicker, it carries more current. So I'm sh showing the chart on the, on the, on the, in the middle that if you increase the film thickness from one to two to three to four microns, the current is not increasing linearly, right? It's starting to plateau, it's starting to saturate. And, uh, and the reason for that, you can see both in the microstructure and from the X-ray diffraction pattern. On the microstructure, you can see when you go from two to five microns, then you get a lot of misaligned grains. The epitaxy starts to break down. Right, the epitaxial quality is not too good, so the epitaxial quality is not good, then it's not going to carry much current. You can also see in the X-ray diffraction uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the scan, the, uh, there's a peak, 200 peak, right? The 200 peak is uh, misaligned grains. The misaligned grain intensity keeps increasing as the film gets thicker. So initially we tried to uh, optimize the process, but we could not. But then we realized it's not the process itself, it's the equipment that needs to be uh, uh, improved. So, MOCVD, that's a process that's being used um, you know, to, uh, to make these films, to the, make the tapes. I'm showing a schematic of that reactor there. Basically, in the MOCVD process, you're actually injecting the precursors through a shower head, and they're depositing the film on a moving tape, which is heated by a susceptor. So the thing is that, yeah, you can see a photograph of the heating of the tape as it's continuously moving uh, you know, from one end to another end. Uh, the thing is, you need to have a really good temperature control when you're growing thick films but you don't have the good control when you have a, this kind of a heating process. Second thing is, when you have a shower head type uh, flow geometry, which is typically was used for MOCBD, you get a lot of turbulence, and that turbulence actually causes non-uniformity, and the non-uniformity causes temperature non-uniformity, uh, non and that really affects the ability to grow thick films. And also, what happens is, generally in MOCBD process, the precursor efficiency, a conversion of precursors to the film is only about 10%. This is true for most MOCVD processes. So a lot of the expensive precursor gets wasted. So really hard to come up with a better design of the reactor in order to uh, address some of these drawbacks of conventional MOCVD tools. So we came with a different uh, technology called advanced MOCVD. So what we did was we threw out the heater. We threw out the shower head, right? So without heating externally, what happened was this material that we use, the substrate that we use is Hasloy, it's a nickel alloy, it's a very resistive material. So we actually pump current directly into the Hasloy, which means the Hasloy can be heated directly without using any heater. So now we can monitor the tape temperature directly with optical probes, we can control the tape temperature really well. We remove the shower head, we have nice laminar flow, and that controls the flow much, much better than what we had before. So by using these two methods, you can see very good temperature control, very good flow control, and we're also converting the precursors a lot more efficiently, about four to five times more efficiently to the superconducting film. That also improves the cost. So with this method, now our goal is now to make the thick films to get the higher price. So that's what I'm showing you here. You can see on the left side what I showed you before with the conventional MOCVD process, um, several misaligned grains when you try to make the films thicker. On the right side, you can see the rightmost side, you can see the film made by advanced MOCVD, 4.6 micron film, is totally featureless. You don't see any kind of a structure because it's a very high quality epitaxial film. You see in the X-ray diffraction also, all the 00L peaks, and you know, there is no misaligned grains in the, in the film. So just by modifying, sometimes the solution is not necessarily in, in the process, but it's in really in the engineering of the, on the, on the reactor or the equipment that's used to make the material. And you can see from this chart, remember I told you the texture is very important. You need to have the grain to grain misalignment within a five degrees or so. It has to be uh, in order to get high, high, good current. And on the chart I'm showing you uh, the out of plane texture, basically the texture uh, out of the plane of the film, and then the texture in the plane of the film. You can see in both cases, the texture is maintained almost constant all the way up to five microns, right? And then in contrast to what you saw before, when they increase the film thickness, the current start to saturate. Here you can see as you increase the film thickness, the current density keeps increasing, the critical current keeps increasing, even up to five microns. And so we're able to actually get some really good performance, even in a thick film, 
So what we are able to make in a two, one or two micron film, now we can get in a four to five micron film. So we can get much, much higher current than was possible. All right, so that is improving the thickness to get the higher current. But also there's another knob to turn, which is actually you can increase, improve the pinning centers, right? You can improve the pinning centers. Remember I told you about the barium zirconate, right? Barium zirconate or uh, barium hafnate that we use as the self-assembled nano columns to, for the pinning centers. What we found was actually there's an opportunity to make the spinning centers a lot more effective. You can actually refine the size of the pinning centers even more by controlling the composition. So what I'm showing the chart there is that um, on the left hand side, we actually as increase the barium content in the film, right? As is, and what I'm showing is barium plus zirconium or copper, which is really mostly increasing the barium content in the film. You can see there is an increase in the lattice parameter of the film, of, of the supernatural film. And actually you can see in the high resolution TEM images on the right hand side, as you go from copperish to barium rich film, the C axis lattice parameter keeps increasing, right? So you can see the effect of that in a, in a couple of slides. So that's what happens as you increase the, you know, the barium content. You can actually see the effect also in this cross section TM images. So what I'm showing here is from left to right, the barium plus zirconium or copper, which is essentially increasing the barium content, is in, uh, increasing the barium content um, from left to right. So what you can see is, you can see the aligned barium zirconium nano columns, right? You can see all the vertically aligned barium zirconium nano columns, that's what you want. But you also see some precipitates horizontally, right, along the AB plane. Uh, these are rare earth oxide precipitates. They are also good, but they aren't as effective as barium zirconium nano columns. So as you increase the barium, you can see one, one thing is that the, uh, the rare earth oxide precipitate density decreases, and the barium columns becomes a lot more continuous. Right? So you can see from this chart that as you increase the barium content, the rare earth oxide intensity actually goes down you know, in, the, in the extra diffraction. And what, consequently, what happens is the pinning capacity, what I'm showing on the, on the chart on the bottom, is uh, pinning ability of the film actually keeps increasing quite a bit, quite drastically, as you increase the barium content. So that is a method that we, we found is quite effective to improve the pinning centers and also to increase the, the critical current density. So actually you can see that chart effect, effectiveness in the chart on the, on the right hand side. As you increase the barium content in the film, you can see there's actually a peak uh, you know, uh, performance. So by now tailoring, right, it's a combination of tailoring the epitaxy by this advanced MOCD process, but also able to control the composition and able to get to a stage where you can actually refine the size of the barium zirconium nano columns and able to get much higher performance than was feasible. And as a consequence of that, consequence, uh, consequently, what, you, what happens is you see the performance of this kind of busy slide, but you just see the slides, uh, the, the what's you see on the top. That's what's made by advanced MOCVD, the performance of the supernic film in the high magnetic fields. So if you compare that to nium titanium, nium 310, or the conventional supernic, supernic today, it's much, much, much higher current carrying capacity. And on the right hand side, what I'm showing here is uh, the red, red circles are the uh, performance of the supernic film made by the advanced emulsivity process and the blue and the purple are what is made by industry today. So the, what's made by advanced emulsivity process is about three to five times better what the industry does today. So with this high current carrying capacity, now the cost can be substantially reduced because like I said, with the high current supernitter, you need much, much less of it to make it to a magnet. All right, so that's all great news, but next, like I said, we always st strive to not only develop the technology, but also translate to manufacturing so that it can be useful, it can be implemented in the industry. So now, how do you now take this technology? Now it has, how do you control this process very well so you, can, you, know, you need to scale up? Our goal is to get to 50 meters. The cha it's quite challenging though. The reason for that is I'm showing this compositional map right here. So you have the rare earth, you have the uh, copper, you have the barium and the zirconium, and what you see on the, red, on, the, on the color chart is the current carrying capacity at 13 Tesla. And what you can see is the red part of the, of the chart is very small, right? So what it means is that you need to control the composition of the film within one atomic percent. Uh, the barium, copper, and the rare earth, and zirconium has to control within one atomic percent in order to get the peak performance. And all these measurements are done by ICP, spectro, uh, indirectly coupled plasma spectroscopy, which is, as you know, is a destructive process. So you cannot really control the composition by destructive process. So you need to have a non-destructive way of measuring the composition in real time as you make the material so that you can control the process. So that's the next challenge. Fortunately, we're able to identify one method that you can do that. So this is a method of two-dimensional X-ray diffraction. So 2D XRD, I think some of you or most of you may actually be aware of that. So um, what you see here on the left is the two charts. 
uh, one is uh, material with a normal amount of barium and one in the middle with the high amount of barium. So you can see in the middle, the sparse just zero, zero else peaks, which is fine. But focus on the one on the top, which I kind of zoomed in, and the, what I showed in, uh, showing in the, in, the, in the center is I kind of zoomed in into the peaks, which are of interest. One is the 103 peak of the supernator, Repco, and another one is the 101 peak of the barium zirconator, the BZO. And what you can see is then you have the novel barium, there's a clear spacing between these two, right? The, you know, between the uh, barium zirconate peak and the YBCO and the Repco peak. Whereas when you have a high barium, which is what you're interested in, you can see the peaks are getting closer together. So the reason is quite simple, because when you add barium, what happens is, I already mentioned to you, the C-axis parameter of the supernic film increases, which is what you see on the bottom on the red circles. Also, simultaneously, the C-axis lattice parameter of the barium zirconate decreases. So what happens is, as you increase the barium, the two lattices get, get closer to each other, and that's why you see that the peaks are getting closer to each other, or the angle between them smaller. So by monitoring the angle between the two, you can actually uh, get a good idea of the composition, right? So that's the idea. So you can actually see that in this chart also. You can see that angle, we call the streaking angle between the two peaks. As, you, as the angle reduces, you can see the barium content in the film is actually higher. And, consequently, and, and because of that, of course, the performance is also better. So this two-dimensional X-ray diffraction is a nice non-destructive way that you can real time, as you're making the tape at high speed, you can actually monitor the composition real time and do it. And with that idea, we actually implemented that. Actually, you can see our uh, MOCVD reactor. You can see this big spool box to uh, hold the spool. And you can see that the X-ray diffraction, uh, um, you know, the unit in there. And on the right-hand side is a zoomed-in image of that X-ray diffraction uh, unit. And you can see the X-ray source and the 2D X-ray detector. And so, some, uh, so uh, while you're making the tape, as you're making the tape, you can actually monitor the various peaks in real time, get an idea of the composition of the film in addition to the texture and the orientation and other phases. So here I'm showing actual data obtained from a 10 meter tape and a five meter tape. You can see the diffraction peaks obtained in real time as we're making the tape. The tape is moving while you're getting the data. You can see all the 00L peaks of the Repco. You can see the BZO, the barium zirconate peak. You can see, see the Repco 103 peak. You can see the rare earth oxide peak. So we can actually collect the intensity, the location, uh, the spread, all the information collected in real time as we're making the tape. So, so this data now can be compiled and you can look at it, right? You can look at the intensity of the various peaks, you can look at the spread of the various peaks, you can look at the position of the various peaks, and then also the angle, right? The streaking angle I told you between the, between the barium circulate and the Repco. So everything can be monitored as you're making the tape. So that really help you to control the process um, you know, much better than what's done now. So, uh, so then, of course, you can create a nice map, a correlation map. So you can look at all these various features, the intensity of the various peaks. You can look at the uh, spread of the various peaks. You can look at the, you know, of the, the critical current and see what really, uh, uh, what really matches really well with the critical current, right? You can get a good idea of that. And you, can take a, and you can take a step further, and you can implement some machine learning methods. And this is what I'm showing here is the, the solid lines, uh, uh, the, actually the dashed lines are the current actually measured, the, the critical current actually measured, uh, three different conditions. And then the solid lines is what's predicted by the machine learning method. We use a set to train the machine learning algorithm and then uh, we use that to predict the rest of the tape. And you can see into that, you see there's a pretty good prediction from the X-ray diffraction data. You can actually predict what the critical current is gonna be. The only thing is all this work was done offline. Right? We collect the data, then we use the machine learning algorithms to actually predict it. But what we want to really do it is in real time. And of course, it needs to be done very fast. You know, everything has to be done quick, you know, at the speed of making the material. And that needs to be done. That needs to be worked on also. So we're collaborating with the experts in, uh, you know, uh, in this technology so that we'll be able to implement in a real time feedback to the process. All right, so uh, even without the real time feedback, we're able to now uh, take this method and go up to 50 meters, like I'm showing here, uh, 50, meter pro, uh, 50 meter long tape that, that is shown in, the, in this chart. And uh, the, what is showing on the left-hand side is the current carrying capacity in high magnetic fields. The red, blue, and the uh, red is what we achieved in a short sample, R&D sample, and the pink is what's achieved on a 50 meter tape. So you can see the 50 meter tape is already performing at about 24% of the performance of a short sample, which is pretty good, and about three times better than what industry makes. 
So we're showing that this technology is not just something lab scale, but can actually be uh, taken to manufacturing also. All right, so let's skip that. So, uh, so uh, finally, I think uh, I'll probably have to go through this fast, running short of time. So we're going, remember I, our goal, I told our goal is to go to 10 times performance, right? So we're already getting four to five times better performance than a conventional tape, but can it go to 10 times? So the simplest idea is to just code both sides of the tape, right? So that's the simplest thing to do. So that is the idea. The beauty of the advanced MOCVD process is that there's no heater, there's no shower head, which means you can code both sides simultaneously in one pass. So you're not adding any more into the process. You're not adding any more material to the process. With the same material, you can code both sides. Uh, so that is the idea. And actually, you can see, but before you grow, coat the supernic film, you need to coat up the buffer layers, right? The buffer layers have to have good texture. And the texture can be monitored in real time with the read. And I'm showing the read patterns on the top side of the film, on the, on the top row. And the bottom row is the read patterns on the bottom side. And you can see a good, uh, you know, good uh, texture obtained on the buffer layers on, on top side and bottom side. And now, if you take that film and now grow it into the MOCVD, I'll skip that, uh, lack of time, let me skip that also. So I uh, can see there that um, uh, on the both sides, the curve on the black curve and the red curve on the two layers, top and bottom side. So now we can get double the performance, right? And that should, you know, that by coding the both sides of the film. So it's an epitaxial film, nan nanoscale engineered using the self assembly process on both sides of the film. So that is what uh, been done recently with the double-sided tapes with advanced MOCVD. Um, and then uh, right now, uh, I can skip that because I had different results. So you can see the barium circuit nano columns. you can see on the top side and the bottom side. So both sides were able to implement the self-assembly process. It's kind of inclined because the image is actually uh, uh, done an inclined uh, orientation, but the C-axis is actually pointing uh, along the direction of the barium circuit nano columns. So on top and bottom side, we're getting good uh, you know, microstructure of the films, both uh, good epitaxy and good, um, you know, uh, self-assembly of the barium circuit nano columns. So if you do that, so this on our results, we got is, the, what you're getting is with the double-sided film, even with the not very thick films, they're able to get five times the performance of commercial tape. And our goal, like I said, is to go to 10 times the performance. And with that, you know, this material is going to be a lot more effective than what is today. All right, so I think with that, I think last step, thing I wanted to talk about is the opportunities, right? Where do you go from here? Uh, opportunities in the core and D. Uh, there are three categories I kind of divided this into. One is high yield manufacturing, right? In order to, um, in order to really make this widespread, right? If you want to make this into every single, or most of the devices for electric power transmission, uh, wind generators, electric aviation, you need lots and lots of this material. So one of the important factors is going to be manufacturing yield. How do you control the yield of the manufacturing? And this data, you know, just kind of a busy slide, but the idea here is just based on what I just told you already. Basically doing a lot of in-situ monitoring of the process, something that needs to be developed. You know, we have already worked on the 2D XRD, but there, there are more opportunities to develop new metrology tools. And we have multiple, multimodal sensor data. We have the temperature, we have the oxygen content, many different parameters are obtained. But then, and then of course you measure the properties and we have the correlations. Then you had to come up with this is very neat how the computer scientists also involved in this whole process to put it together to this machine learning methods so that we can actually have a nice feedback control. Right now we are kind of doing open. We like to actually have good, good feedback control. So that is something that needs to be done. And uh, this will require collaboration of material scientists, uh, engineers, as well as computer scientists. Uh, another thing here also working on is another, uh, other metrology methods. I mentioned uh, two-dimensional X-ray diffraction. Raman spectroscopy is another one. So this is a case um, a result just showing a uh, Raman map obtained on a sample. So this is actually a small sample where we are measuring the Raman spectroscopy image across the width of the sample. And you can see the various Raman peaks, the O2, O3 peak, the O4 peak, the cation disorder peak, and all the peaks actually you can image it and you can correlate that to the performance. So it is still not done kind of in the short coupons. But that's something we are looking into implementing into a real in, in a real time, uh, real to real process as a metrology tool. Right. The second opportunity is to really get to high throughput. Right, like I said, if we need much much higher volume production, we need to be able to do a lot more of this very fast, and uh, so we need to have high growth rate processes. Uh, so right now, if you look at what's happening today in, in this industry. The process, the throughput of this technology is limited by the superintended deposition. Like I said, there are many different processes. You have substrate, 
you have the buffer layers, you have the superconductor, you have the silver, you have the copper, but the superconductor is really the determining, uh, the rate limiting step. So what industry right now, they're doing, in this case, industry is doing PLD or pulse limit deposition, they are just multiplying the tools, just adding five tools, 10 tools, just to increase the capacity, which obviously is the ideal way, it's not the optimal way to do it. And what that does, it actually, if you look at the cost breakdown of the superconducting tape, you can see the Repco, you can see the Repco on the overhead, right? Those are the biggest cost components. That's mainly because the Repco, you need many, many of these tools, the addition tools to make this Repco film. So a better way to be developed, the better way needs to be developed in order to make it go faster rather than just multiplying the number of tools, right? So here's where, again, the material science comes in, is that how do you now do fast without degrading the epitaxy, right? On the left-hand side, I'm showing a chart where it's showing the texture. Remember, I show the texture is very important for the superconducting film. You can see the texture is actually increasing, which means the epitaxy is starting to really degrading as you grow faster, as you make the films faster, which is not unusual. Gallium arsenide and gallium nitride and a lot of other connected by MOCVD, other films, uh, other methods, they actually degrade to go faster. But we need to come up with a solution. How do you make it go faster? On the right-hand side, I'm showing also the, cur the current density is actually decreasing as you increase the depression rate. So those challenges need to be addressed. How do you go faster and still get the same current carrying capacity? Well, the last topic here is that you know, uh, our opportunity is to incorporate features which are important for applications. Right? I didn't really cover much of that today, uh, but there are a few things which are important for applications. One is something called quench. And let me just quickly try to explain that in this slide. So what happens is the superintendent carries so much current. So that tape I'm showing right there, that can carry you know, 500 amperes, right? You're carrying it over a very small cross-section. If there's any defect, you're trying to make a kilometer long tape, if there's one defect, that can be a source of hot spot. That, 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 that can start heating up. Once it heats up, what happens is, since you're winding the magnets and the magnets are insulated, so the whole magnet can break down. So the uh, burn up, you can see the you know, burnout of a magnet and uh, in this case a cable, it, it, because so much energy is being dumped into that area, it completely burns out. So you need to have a way to prevent the thermal runaway, and basically you need to have what you call defect tolerant tapes, self-healing tapes, tapes that can, in spite of defects, can still heal themselves. So that's still an area that needs to be developed. And the last thing I want to mention before I wrap up is that so far I talked about flat tapes, right? Because of thin films, you always think about flat geometry. That's what we are doing here. But most superintendents right now that's used today for MRIs and for uh, particle accelerators and other applications, they're all round. There are round geometries because it's a lot easier to make very complex magnets uh, for particle accelerators, even for making uh, stator windings for motors and generators, you need, you need to have a round wire, right? So unfortunately, our tape is not round, it's flat. However, we have developed methods, in this case, a method uh, uh, called star wire, where it actually is flat tape, and uh, not any tape, but a specially made tape, and actually converting into a round wire. And actually, that can be made into a cable also, in this case, a star cable. So those kind of methods also need to be developed. So superintendents even further. I think it's become a long way in the last 30 years through and so on. But you know, for really large-scale commercial application, I really believe, I've been working in this field for 37 years now, right from the discovery from 1987. Uh, but I really believe the 2020s is really the decade where the HTS really starts is taking off. It's already taking off to a commercial product. Like I said, right now there's so much demand for the superconductors that's not under supply. New company, I really believe this is going to really help enable the clean energy transition. Because these superconductors can be used wherever power is being generated, stored, transmitted, or used. So you can apply, we can apply every single area of power transmission and power generation and so on. Work with the group, happy to engage with you. With that, let me stop and happy to answer any questions. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions or comments to ask to Professor Selva. Please. A, mic, uh, a bit of a general question in the context of transporting the electricity over a long period of time. Right. A few words about the challenge of cryostating. At right, right. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. So yeah, so uh, today actually um, uh, there are many uh, power cables already installed. Uh, I showed you one example, the very one, first one. Right now there are about 12 to 15 cables already installed on the grid uh, around the world. Uh, these are usually short lengths. The longest one that's being built right now is 12 miles long. 
um, and uh, but mostly in urban areas where it's going to be more using existing uh, um, put these in. Of course, what happens is when it gets long, like 100 miles long, then you need to have pumping stations because you need to have you need to increase the pressure back up because you need to have the liquid nitrogen flow through these uh, cryostats. That needs to be done. Um, so there are some new technologies, uh, new companies. They are installing some uh, overhead power. Plan to use evaporative cooling of a liquid nitrogen. So they're saying that now you can extend the distances between the pumping stations by more than 10. So instead of every, say, 10 miles, probably every 100 miles. So I think there are some innovations coming along those lines also. But that's an important thing. If you want, right now, a lot of the uh, power transmission, for superfunding power transmission is all short, mostly in urban areas. But if you want to go to long distance, like 1,000 miles, 1,000 kilometers, then you do this issue of uh, you know uh, you know uh, of cooling required every you know every hundred miles. Yeah. Yeah. Next year, uh, it's still done by the same uh, method which we have scaled up. But I think uh, you know, um, uh, but you know we, what I this is I showed you is all short pieces only that long. Uh, but our goal is next year uh, we'll have the scaled up. Yeah. No more. Here, please. Very nice presentation. Uh, well, my question is with, uh, well, you use here a high temperature superconductor. So like, what are the, um, the properties that you search for take a into the, well, uh, well, th this. I think, um, you know, um, so it is a ceramic. So if you take a superconductor by itself, very low. Uh, however, the good thing is, you know, the thickness of the film is very small. It's only a few microns thick. Uh, so mechanically, uh, the Hasloy, the nickel alloy, provides a strength. Uh, the yield strength of the Hasloy is about 700 megapascal, which means you can actually bend this uh, tape until the Hasloy yields. So typically, only at 700 megapascal, you start to see degradation in the superconducting film. You know, that's one thing, which is about 0.5% strain, 0.6% strain, which is pretty good for most applications. And I didn't actually go into the details. But the round wire I showed you, so we actually make a special kind of tape where we put the superconducting film in the neutral plane. So we actually uh, make the uh, tape in such a way the superconducting film is close to the center, you know, which is close to the neutral, neutral plane, which as you know, against any strain. So now we can actually bend the superconducting tape, not just typically a, a superconducting tape you can bend it around one centimeter, but this special tape we can actually bend it down to 0.5 millimeters. So. Uh, so there are ways that you can engineer uh, a ceramic material into a highly flexible wire. Yeah. Any other question or comment? No more. Hi. Um, 